Yeah, it's your boy Nefakari Dessaline back in the building. Yes, indeed. And today we're going to talk about the greatest black man of all time, General Jean-Jacques Dessaline. Let's get into it. Now, I know you clicked the video because you've seen the title and I stand on everything I said. And by the end of this video, you're going to understand why. To put it in simple terms, the reason Dessaline has the title of the greatest black man of all time is because what he did was never done before and it hasn't happened since. Keep in mind that Dessaline never seen 50 years of age. He died at the age of 48, left a legacy and reputation that no black man has been able to touch since then. Even when you read and study his life story, it doesn't even seem real. You would think it's like some comic book hero or a plot to a movie, but nah, this is real life, real life story, real biography. And something that we forget, that Celine is of the same generation as the American founding fathers. The same founding fathers that we are taught to venerate and worship as young boys and girls. But they never tell us about Dessaline. They never tell us about Toussaint. They never tell us about Christophe. They never tell us about Pichon. They erase them from the history books and act like they never existed. But I guarantee Thomas Jefferson heard about them. I guarantee George Washington heard about them. I guarantee John Adams heard about them. So how come we ain't heard about them? How come we aren't taught their life story and their legacy the same way we are taught George Washington? When Dessaline accomplished a hundred times more than George Washington and he didn't leave any blemishes on his legacy. Unlike George Washington, we can measure up his life story and we can see that it was blemishes, it was tarnishes, it was marks all over. I mean, you died as a slave owner. I mean, come on, man. What are we talking about right here? From the age of 9, 10, 11 years old, we're taught about slave owners and human traffickers and men who pretty much disrespected our sovereignty and dignity, but the men who defended our sovereignty and dignity, they don't even give them a mention or even a whisper. We just act like they never even came through. You would think the story of a young boy who was born into the sugarcane plantations and grew up to defeat not one, not two, but three colonial armies and be declared the head of state of the first nation to abolish slavery in the Western Hemisphere. You would think that story would be have movies and TV shows and documentaries and books and constant literature and similar to Alexander the Great, Rome, Greece. But no, no, we act like he never even existed. But today we're going to change the narrative. We're going to give the proper honor and respect to our ancestors, to the black men who really came through and stood on business, stood on dignity, stood on righteousness and showed us how to do it and left a legacy and reputation that we could only wish to even fill in halfway. So let's get into it. General Jean-Jacques Dessalines born in the year 1758. As we know, enslaved people did not have the best records. So we can't say for 100% fact which origin story is the correct one, but I'm gonna give you each one that I've heard from various historians. The first one that I've heard and the most common one is that Dessaline was born in Northern Haiti in the sugarcane plantation, directly born into the institution of slavery. Keep in mind that the plantations in the Caribbean, particularly in Haiti, the ones controlled by the French, were among the most brutal in the world in terms of conditions and life expectancy. Most of the Africans imported into the island died from organ failure within 18 to 24 months. The business model of the French colonial empire was we are just going to import new Africans every year and we're just going to up the ante. If we got to get more Africans, we're going to get more money and import more Africans. And this is part of the reason why the Haitian Revolution even took place. It was these particularly brutal conditions that enslaved Africans were forced to work under that inspired the rage, the ball of fire that became of the Haitian Revolution and the amount of gallons of bloodshed that occurred shortly afterwards. In the years leading up to the Haitian Revolution in 1791, there were many court cases that were brought before the French judges because of the particular brutality that slave owners were inflicting upon their enslaved property, meaning that there were cases that came before judges of homicide investigations where young girls 15 16 years old lost their life in the most brutal of fashions so of course the retaliation that came of the haste revolution was to be expected and really it should have came as no surprise in the first origin story it is said that Dessaline's mother passed away shortly after he was born and he was given unto the care of a woman that was close to his mother who was the famous Dahomey warrior his aunt Victoria Montu and in fact later down the line when Dessaline became head of state she was given the first official state funeral when she passed away shortly after independence was declared many would call her the queen mother of the nation in the second origin story it is said that Dessaline and his mother were kidnapped sometime around when he was eight nine years old it is also said that Victoria Montu was kidnapped as well around that same time and his mother passed away either during the voyage or shortly after they landed and he was given onto the care of Victoria. Nobody knows exactly which ethnic group in Africa that Dessaline comes from, but we do know that he was raised by a Dahomey woman which is present day Benin in West Africa. Now he could have been from any ethnic group in Africa, but as a young boy, the culture that he was raised under, the language that he knew, the culture that he knew, the woman that he looked up as a mother figure was from the Daome nation, the Daome kingdom. So Dessaline 
spiritually, culturally, he would be a Daome man. Nobody knows his original ethnic group. Nobody knows his original ethnic origins, but we do know Dessaline was raised as a Daome man. And the Daome culture is a military culture where children as young as eight, nine years old are inducted into the military. Yes, indeed. It was a nation that was based on their military strength, their military prowess. They were known for being the most feared and respected and fierce warriors in West Africa. And remember, I got to make that video on the number of mistakes that the French government made that led to the Haitian Revolution and them losing their most profitable colony. One of their biggest mistakes is these guys kidnapped soldiers, warriors, and generals from heavily respected armies in West Africa. And they thought that they wouldn't be overthrown from power. Are you serious? Think about it for a second. If you were going to take a group of people to bring them to a whole nother foreign land to work for you for free, would you take the five-star general of the army? Would you take the captain of the Navy? Would you take the secretary of defense? No, you wouldn't, bro. No, you wouldn't. You would probably take some undereducated, you know, some guy off the street, some guy who don't have much. Why would you take like a, a person from the elite class, a person who has military service under his belt in his resume? Logically, it makes no sense. But when you think about the fact that this was the most profitable colony, at what cost? You have to think about it. Every 24 months, your entire batch that you just imported a year ago, two years ago, died off. Now you got to import a new batch of Africans. And then you're importing Africans that have military backgrounds. So of course, naturally, when you're only focused on the money, you're only focused on the profit. You're only focused on trying to stack up more money than you stacked up last year. Yes, these are the mistakes that the French made along the way. They had their eyes on the prize, meaning that Profit was the only thing that they cared about. Work conditions, improving the lives and the welfare of their quote unquote property. That was not on the agenda. Focusing on who you're bringing into the colony. That was not on the agenda. All they cared about was bringing in more bodies, bringing in more workers, bringing in more people to come down the colony. That's all they cared about. And that's why the colony was the most profitable on the planet because it was built off the blood and the backs of our ancestors. So, you know, unfortunately, because the French were so hyper-focused on the profit and not hyper-focused on anything else, they got ran out of town and they lost everything. Now, in terms of Dessaline's father, we don't really know what happened of him. We do know that Dessaline had brothers. We do know he had siblings that served in the revolutionary army as well. And I believe that Dessaline also either had a son or a grandson or a nephew that became the police chief of Port-au-Prince in the mid 1800s. During his life, Dessaline had two owners. He originally was named Jean-Jacques Duclos, which was the last name of his original slave owner, which was, of course, a white Frenchman. He took on the name Dessaline when he came under the rulership of a black mulatto, a free black mulatto, who, in my opinion, I believe that this was somebody who was purchasing his freedom because in that time that is how you would purchase somebody's freedom you would get your own freedom and then you would work yourself into a position where you could purchase your family your friends your cousins whatever they may be and technically you would own them technically you would purchase them but obviously you're not going to enslave your own family your own friends your own loved ones you are just purchasing their freedom in a roundabout way you're just finding a loophole in the system so that is how he became Jean-Jacques Dessaline the Dessaline came from the free black man that purchased him and during his time on the Duclos plantation, Dessaline was known as a rebellious child. In fact, as a grown man, he had scars and he had marks all over his body from the beatings and the torture that he took under the rulership of the French planters. For the first 30 years of his life, Dessaline was enslaved. Every single waking moment of his existence was given to making white men more rich. And then shortly after that, he joined the Haitian Revolutionary Army. So even then, it's not like he was free. It's not like he could sit back and relax. He never really got to enjoy any free time until 1804 when independence was declared but then he died in 1806 so you could say Dessaline pretty much had two years on top but even those two years he was a head of state it wasn't like he was just on vacation so even then he wasn't really free so Dessaline's entire life pretty much had no realization had no rest had no off button had no stop button had no time to sit back and relax and reflect he never had no time it was on go mode until the day he was born until the day he died and the reason why I want to emphasize that he spent the first 30 years of his existence enslaved is because this is going to have a heavy effect on how he would deal with others and how he would manage the country and how he would develop his personality traits as a military commander during the Haitian Revolution. 30 years under the yoke, under the rulership, under the oppression, under the brutality of another group of people. 30 years seeing debauchery and degeneracy and brutality and homicide and the taking of life and the wanton lack of care for life this would have a heavy duty effect on him as a leader but this would be the catalyst and the gas to the fuel to the fire to have him lead the revolution to have him lead us to victory so at the end of the day i'm not saying Dessaline was perfect but i'm saying take everything into account 
Unlike General Ang Christophe, who was a decorated military veteran by the time he was in his early 20s, who had military experience during the Haitian Revolution at the Siege of Savannah, Dessaline, his first taste of military combat came during the Haitian Revolution. But remember what I said, he was raised by a Dame woman. He was raised by a female Dame warrior. So even though he did not see his first taste of combat until the revolution, Dessaline was already raised and primed and groomed to become the greatest general of all time. Now, keep in mind, in the early 1790s, there was no social media. There was no cell phones, there were no letters, there was no US Postal Service, there was no Amazon, there was no Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, there was no form of digital communication. But as we know, in the summer of 1791, you could say that we had the first official Pan-African Conference because it was black people from all different ethnic groups in Africa. We came through by the thousands and thousands and we would meet in the middle of the night, you know, after everyone don't went to sleep, you know, master think we, you know, master think we in deep sleep, it's like two, three in the morning and we sneaking out into the woods, into the mountains and we plotting and we planning because we didn't just strike like a chicken without his head cut off. This was planned. This was something that was calculated before the violence started. We had to sit down like men. We had to sit down like men and women because the women were there too. I'm not going to discount the women. The women were right alongside their men. Black women, yes. The black women of the Haitian Revolution, the greatest generation of black women to ever walk the earth. I don't care what you say. I don't care what other generation of women you put before me. Ain't no other black woman stand tall like the women of the Haitian Revolution, the greatest of all time. And I promise you, I got to make a video about each and every legendary key female figure from the Haitian Revolution because we got to set that example for our sisters to know what it really means to be a black woman. But like I say, we plotted and we planned and we linked up in the middle of the night before the violence started. We had to get everybody in order, get the hierarchy in order to know who's leading the way, who's following and what's going to be the plan and to know that we're going to die behind everything we do. So Dessaline was among these Africans who was at these, you know, secret meetings in the middle of the night. And remember what I said, Dessaline, he got 30 plus years of hatred in his heart. He got 30 plus years of pain in his heart so of course Dessaline was at these secret meetings and originally Dessaline was not under the rulership of Toussaint Louverture he did not meet Toussaint until months later originally he was under the rulership of Jean-Francois Papillon and George Biasu now these two men I'm praying to God I'm praying to the ancestors I love y'all thank y'all that y'all got these two men out the way let me tell you Haiti would have never been able to grow under the prosperity that King Uncle Christophe brought it to. And man, we would have never been able to even be independent if we had let Jean Francois and George Biasu lead the way. Because these brothers, they were not thinking about no freedom, justice, and equality. These brothers, they were trying to get rich and enrich themselves. They were like, listen, forget all that slavery nonsense. Listen, we got to throw everybody back into slavery so we can be rich, so we can be the new slave owners. That's, that's what we're going to do. That's what they wanted to do. They did not want to, you know, fight off the European colonists so we can, you know, be free and live as men and live in, in peace and dignity. They were not on no pro-blackness at all. They would have sold us out to the highest bidder. We're not going to get too deep into their life story, but let's just thank the ancestors that Toussaint and Dessaline and Christophe took over because I'm telling you, we would have never won a war if these brothers would have been in the driver's seat. Listen, they would have sold us out for a bag of chips. I promise you. I promise you. And when I do a video on them, should I even do a video on them? Get in the comment section. And let me know because maybe they don't even deserve a video. But listen, let's just thank God that Toussaint took the reins because it would have went and got crashed off a damn cliff. But originally, yes, Dessaline was under the rulership of Jean-Francois Papillon and George Biasu. Later, a few months down the line, he would meet up with Toussaint Louverture and he would pledge his allegiance to Toussaint and the rest is history. By late August 1791, the entire northern region had become a wall of fire. Every European that was spotted was eliminated or taken prisoner. All European women that got captured were violated. Vengeance was the war cry in the order of the day. The only people spared from the violence were priests and medical doctors. Several plantations were destroyed. The whites responded with random violence, lynching up to 30 Africans per day, including women and children. The Africans responded by displaying European heads on pikes. The rebel forces grew up to 100,000 within a few weeks. Now remember, the entire enslaved population is around close to 400,000. So about one fourth of the entire enslaved population is up in arms right now. And of course, as you know, the majority of people are never gonna be down to sacrifice their life for the collective. So the majority of people are still chilling on a the plantation. They still scared. They still, they don't wanna, you know, dump their feet in the pool. But guess what? A lot of them died in retaliation for no reason because they didn't wanna go join the rebels and, you know, hide in the mountains and, you know, the roving bandits. They didn't wanna go join, you know, make no trouble. Well, guess what? A lot of them lost their lives because they were just easy targets. So when the rebels came through destroying plantations and taking life the people who were too scared to join the rebel factions guess what you lost your life because when the white man wanted to get revenge 
he pretty much took the next person closest to him. So you were still on the plantation. You lost your life. You got hanged for no reason because you were too scared to go dip in the middle of the night and go join the rebels. And I really feel bad for those people because you would think, you know, you were going to die anyway. So you might as well die for righteousness. You might as well die to defend your people. You might as well die for something that means something. But a lot of people died for no reason because when we came through smashing, guess what? You were still on the plantation. So you got hung, you know, you know, rest in peace to the ancestors that got hung because they were too scared to, you know, pick up arms. You know, that's what happens, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but hey, we gave out the call. You know, you knew about it because guess what? Every enslaved African knew what was going on. Everybody knew that the attacks were coming. And if you were too scared to join the attacks and you had to suffer the backlash and the repercussions, you should have joined the attacks. You should have joined the rebels. You know, told you so. You know, told you so. You were going to die anyway. You know, so you might as well die for freedom. The mulattoes were caught in the middle because many of them had European family members. But remember, there was a caste system on the island with the white Frenchman being on top. And many mulattoes took this golden opportunity to join with the Africans and attack the common enemy. Many came from privileged economic backgrounds. Many of the mulattoes were the ones who controlled business and the economy, but they could not join into the arena of politics and they could not dominate socially. So they armed the Africans, they clothed the Africans, they housed the Africans. And remember, like I always say, there was a spectrum. On one spectrum, you had the European identified mulattoes. And then on the other spectrum, you had the African identified mulattoes. And then you had the guys in the middle. The more African identified mulattoes, you know, they would more hang out with the free blacks. They would let, you know, their own property be hideout spots and hangout spots for free blacks and runaway slaves. Then you had the European identified Africans that joined with the French militia to defend the colony because many of them seen it as their father's property. Many of the mulattoes and the free blacks also had military experience from the American Revolution. So picking up arms and getting it popping on the battlefield is nothing new to them. They are very familiar. Remember, the revolution popped off in the summer of 1791. By 1792, the rebel forces controlled over 30% of the island, which forced France to capitulate and grant certain political rights to the free mulattoes and the free blacks. This decision outraged the European powers, including the United States. France also sent thousands of soldiers and a new governor, Leger Sontenax, to control the island. News of the 1791 uprising reached France through the English media from a British ambassador stationed in Jamaica. <laughs> The French government heard that their colony was up in flames through a random foreign ambassador stationed in another colony <laughs> because the people stationed at the colony did not want to deliver the news that the colony is going up in flames to the king of France. Because how would he take that? How would he take that? The people who are running France, how would they take the news that everything that you work for, your most prized possession, your crown jewel, the most profitable colony on the planet is close to 50% being taken over by the same Africans that you enslaved. How do you rectify that? How do you deal with that personally as a capitalist trying to squeeze as much profit as you can? Toussaint spent most of 1792 training soldiers. The constant political tension between the rich mulattoes and the white bourgeoisie allowed the Africans time and space to gather among themselves due to the slave revolt being disregarded as a temporary riot that will die down when the colonial elite and the French elite eventually come to an agreement. In 1793, the rich whites in Haiti became annoyed with the political and economic instability of the colony and were seeking to install British rulership over the island in hopes of fully restoring slavery. So here you got a situation where now the French planters going on two years, the instability is insane. You know, guess what? We still coming through destroying plantations in the middle of the night, every now and then random attacks. So they are annoyed with the constant push and pull. They're annoyed with the constant making concessions to the mulattoes and the free blacks. So they're thinking, you know what? Let's just break away from France altogether. Let's link up with the British and let's get this slavery thing back popping how it's supposed to be. British colonists were also excited at the prospect of acquiring the territory and the large profits generated from the richest colony on the planet. The French government responded by declaring war on Great Britain. Spain linked up with Great Britain and they invaded the colony. Taking advantage of the chaos, enslaved Africans joined the British and the Spanish where they received weapons, food, medicine, naval support, and military training. By this time, Toussaint already had 600 trained soldiers under his rulership and suggested to Spain to abolish slavery as a way to garner support among the masses, but Spain refused. Toussaint offered his allegiance to the French if they agreed to recognize the freedoms and liberties of Africans. They also refused. Enslaved Africans would routinely invade the northern plantations by the thousands, causing destruction and escaping back into the mountains. Boxed in from enemies on all sides, France agreed to grant freedom to the slaves in 1793 throughout all of its colonies. Now, guess what? We did not just get freedom just for us in 1793. Every Francophone enslaved African was granted his freedom in 1793. Because Toussaint and Dessaline and Christophe and all the great ancestors that came before us, they put in that work, bruh. Let's get back into it.
Toussaint quietly switches allegiance to the French in 1794. Enslaved Africans in the South began to emerge victorious, taking control of certain regions. Mulatto General André Rigaud began to gain popularity around the same time, defending the colony against the British and establishing Mulatto domination in the Port-au-Prince region. Toussaint continued to grow and train his personal rebel army and traveled throughout the colony constructing maps of the island. It was around this time where he met Dessalines, who he originally appointed as a guide. Shortly after, Toussaint's forces would go on to conquer several northern cities and his army of troops would rise into the many thousands, including a few white military men that chose to surrender and switch allegiance. The Spanish, still furious at Toussaint's betrayal, demanded his head. Around that time, the British were also making advances onto the island and taking control of certain parts in the west and the south while the Spanish made advances in the north. Bringing his 4,000 man personal army under the French, Toussaint helped defend the northern regions from being captured. If the British and Spanish conquered the colony, then slavery would immediately be reestablished. The Spanish forces were embarrassed on the battlefield and driven out of the colony. Toussaint, in collaboration with mulatto generals like André Rigaud, defeated the British, who were also being destroyed by yellow fever. The British invasion of Haiti remains the most embarrassing moment in British military history, where millions of dollars were invested, thousands of troops were sent, and almost all of the men died. The vast majority of Toussaint's army included African-born slaves, plantation-born slaves, and some free blacks like Christophe who quit his job and joined Toussaint's army in the mountains. Around this time, a prominent Maroon leader joined Toussaint's forces, General La Plume, a formerly enslaved African who controlled an army of 3,000 men in the mountains. This heavy acquisition increased Toussaint's power greatly as his personal army grew closer to 10,000 strong. By 1796, Toussaint was the most powerful person in northern Haiti and established an economic and military alliance with with Governor Etienne Laveau, a white Frenchman who became close friends with Toussaint, similar to how Christophe would become close friends with British abolitionist Thomas Clarkson. This relationship between Toussaint and Laveau raised eyebrows among the mulatto elite who were seeking domination over the entire island and saw the African generals as rivals to be eliminated. On many occasions, mulattoes would be caught leaking information to the British government as well as abandoning Toussaint's army mid-battle. The mulatto elite wanted to restore slavery and inherit the colonial properties their fathers left behind. One morning while eating breakfast, mulatto generals attempted to overthrow General Lavo, assaulting him and sending him to prison. Toussaint mobilized his troops and marched on the city to free Lavo. Dessalines was on the front line during this invasion. The mulatto generals responsible for Lavo's arrest ended up fleeing the city. For his loyalty, Lavo officially appointed Toussaint as lieutenant general over the entire island. In 1796, something next returned to the island and realized the mulattoes were no longer loyal to France, which drew him closer to the blacks. Now, something next is what I call the first white liberal. You know, he supported pro-black policies. He openly dated black and mulatto women. He hung out with black men, loved black music. In a world of slavery, in a world of European white supremacy, let's just something next, he was a cool white boy. You know, basically, in short terms, he was cool peoples. In fact, Leger Sontanax was responsible for over 100,000 guns getting into the hands of the Haitian rebels. And it's not because, like I said, he was an enlightened white boy with the spirit of Jesus Christ. He felt that he was working in his personal best interest, and he felt that arming and getting closer to the blacks would help maintain the colony from being destroyed underneath him. The blacks solidified power in the north under Toussaint Dessalines, and the mulattoes solidified power in the south under General André Rigaud. Heavily outnumbered by the Africans, the mulattoes found strength in their educated backgrounds and staying up to date with international politics. They were the first to discover the French Empire's desire to restore white supremacist domination over the entire island. André Rigaud confined Africans to the plantation within the towns he controlled and never imprisoned or convicted a fellow mulatto of a crime. Through the restoration of plantation labor, André Rigaud was able to operate self-sufficiently without loans or assistance and was able to purchase his own weapons and sustain his own 6,000-man army in the south. Something next appointed Toussaint to the position of governor over the entire island in 1797. Shortly after, Toussaint ordered Something next to leave the island peacefully or be escorted out by force, and this upset many of the masses because Something next was viewed as one of the good whites. Toussaint became the most powerful figure on the island, with only his mulatto rivals in the south standing in his way. War was inevitable. The French Empire became even more hostile and rumors began to circulate about the potential restoration of slavery. Toussaint also became worried about his son's safety in France. André Rigaud refused to recognize Toussaint's government, but both men were in agreement that the British must be defeated and removed from the island. The British had been sending agents, spies, bribing soldiers and funding rebel groups to cause chaos in the colony for years. Toussaint and Rigaud collaborated and marched on British-controlled territories. The Haitians won every battle and the British were ready to declare a truce within a week. In August 1798, Toussaint and British General Thomas Maitland 
held a secret meeting where they negotiated terms of surrender. The British agreed to evacuate the entire island, return all occupied territories, and no longer interfere in Haitian politics. France sent Thomas Edouville to Haiti in 1798 as an agent and also to keep Toussaint in check in fear of his growing power on the international stage. In seven years, Toussaint went from local plantation manager to an international politician doing business with world powers at the head of a world-respected African army with victories against the British and the Spanish. Dessalines commanded many successful engagements, including the captives of Jacques Mel, Petit Guave, Miaguan, Unsavo, and many, many more. Dessalines gained a reputation for his take no prisoners policy and for burning entire homes and villages to the ground. Thomas Edouville began causing drama in the South, encouraging André Rigaud to assassinate Toussaint and reconcile with the French. André Rigaud had been isolated and operating on his own for years, building up young mulatto protégés like Alexander Pétion and Jean-Pierre Boyer, two generals that would go on to become Haitian presidents. Around this time, Toussaint desired to solidify trade relations with the United States and John Adams' administration, who respected Toussaint's army, unlike Thomas Jefferson, who cut off Haiti entirely and called him savages. To ensure his own safety from British invasion, Toussaint threatened the colonial governor of Jamaica that he would send Africans to his island by boat to burn all the plantations to the ground if the British Empire did not honor their agreement. In exchange, Toussaint would respect their territory. Now remember, through all these negotiations, through all these military engagements, Dessalines is the one carrying out all of these orders on the behalf of Toussaint. Meaning that when Toussaint goes into negotiations with these world powers, he comes in as a humble man, as a friendly man, as a harmless man in appearance. But if he doesn't get his way, he's going to have Dessaline on speed dial. Your territory is going to be occupied on lockdown and it's going to be burned to the ground to ash. So you have to understand, Toussaint was a humble man. I believe he was 5'5 five five and like 140 pounds, you know, small guy, small in stature, but big in spirit. And he would not be, you know, on the front lines carrying out the bloodshed and burning the entire city to the ground. No, he would be he would be on the field. He would be in the action. But Dessaline, he would be the one that was most famous for being on the front line, for being the one that is leading the troops and leading the battle. So, yes, yes, Dessaline would be the one on the boat. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm imagining, you know, Toussaint would be sending Dessaline, you know, as the captain of the boat going down to Jamaica and, you know, setting it up on fire. So, you know, uh, yeah, Dessaline was the negotiation tool, you know, and they knew it. They knew it. They knew it, man. They knew it. France grew increasingly uncomfortable as Toussaint began to flex his muscles. The British, realizing that the French would send an army to Haiti to restore full French rulership, offered to provide Toussaint's government funding, weapons, and naval support as a way to indirectly defeat the French. The British also guaranteed additional support from the American military as both nations wanted to get France out of North America and out of the Caribbean. Toussaint did not jump at the offer, becoming suspicious that British presence on the land and seas would lead to his overthrow and the reestablishment of slavery under British rule. Toussaint declined, but agreed to purchase British weapons without any strings attached. Thomas Edouville continued to cause drama on the island, promoting white Frenchmen to guard the coast and firing Toussaint's nephew, Moise, from the army, who was the second most popular military man in Haiti at the time. In response, Toussaint ordered Dessalines to march into the northern city and arrest Edouville. Toussaint also had three of Edouville's bodyguards assassinated, and by the time the African generals arrived, Edouville had already boarded the ship back to France. Toussaint reinstated his nephew and restored order on the island. In a speech the following day, Toussaint said, remember, there is only one Toussaint Louverture in Haiti, and at his name, everyone must tremble. Before Edouville fled, he encouraged André Rigaud to officially establish his own government and capture key cities like Jacmel and Léogane in hopes of creating civil war until France was ready to invade. Anticipating an incoming French invasion, Toussaint Dessalines could not allow André Rigaud to establish his own separate government for security and logistical reasons. Toussaint began making plans to destroy the mulatto strongholds in the south and bring in the entire island under his rulership. Toussaint anticipated that André Rigaud and his men would ally with their French fathers against him, so he concluded that they must be taken out. And considering that Edouville was a representative of the French government, Toussaint felt that demanding his arrest and killing members of his security detail could be seen as an act of war against France, so he was ready for the smoke. In June 1799, André Rigaud mobilized 4,000 men and began marching on various cities and assuming authority over them. André Rigaud's supporters in the north launched a rebellion against Toussaint. Dessalines was sent to crush the mulatto uprisings in the south. All traders in the north were put to death. The U.S. provided naval support by blockading all of André Rigaud's ports. By 1799, Toussaint's army grew to 50,000, a large increase from the modest 600-man army he originally started with. André Rigaud only had 15,000 troops in total. 
Henri Christophe and Dessalines controlled both the right and left wings, and U.S. warships transported the African army to mulatto strongholds where they ambushed the mulatto troops. Toussaint had André Rigaud's stronghold at Jacques Mel surrounded for months, starving the city. The mulatto defense was led by Alexander Pechon, future president of Haiti. Pechon fought his way out of Jacques Mel, but him and André Rigaud ended up fleeing the country into exile. By summer 1800, the entire colony was under African administration after nine years of war. Toussaint sent Dessalines to the south to purge enemy troops. 400 men died. The rest fled to Cuba, France, and the United States. By 1801, Toussaint captured the Dominican Republic, abolished slavery, and had control over the entire island of Hispaniola after 10 years of war. The entire island was under the control of black men. And this was done under the military genius of Toussaint and Dessalines. For years, the Spanish forces have been kidnapping Africans across the border to bring them back into bondage. This was the statement given to the media by Toussaint as a justification for the conquer. Political genius, Toussaint established certain friendships in Washington and sometimes consulted with diplomats from America on topics such as nation building and strengthening the economy. Toussaint Dessalines established a police force on the port to decrease illegal activity. The transport of contraband was common under the French. I feel that it's around this period, between 1799 and 1802, that the fruits of their labor began to grow. Toussaint, Christophe, and Dessalines began to make their fortunes, becoming millionaires and establishing the first African ruling class in the Western Hemisphere. The African generals owned several properties and already began establishing monuments on the island. Haiti is also the first country in the Western Hemisphere to desegregate places of business and education. In 1801, all stores, schools, hotels, and other establishments were open to everybody. Blacks, whites, foreign nationals, everybody. Discrimination was non-existent under the Toussaint administration. Interracial relationships were also allowed, and many foreigners from America ended up marrying mulatto women on the island. All of these social reforms came over 150 years before the United States would follow suit in the 1960s and 70s, which only happened because blacks in America had their own revolt during that era. In 1801, Toussaint had restored Haiti's economy to two-thirds of what it was during the most profitable years under French rulership. The island became a popular travel destination. Toussaint became worldwide known as the head of state and respected for defeating three governments with the help of his African general, Dessalines. Those three governments include Great Britain, Spain, and André Rigaud's Southern Mulatto regime. Loyalty was a common theme throughout the revolution. Treason was punished by death. And it was for this reason that Toussaint sent Dessalines to assassinate his own nephew, Moïse. And this goes to show how deeply these men desired freedom and independence. Toussaint had his own nephew assassinated. His own nephew that he raised up since a young boy. He eliminated him. He sent Dessalines to go wipe him out. And Dessalines, he's known for putting whites to the sword. He's famous for putting Europeans to the sword. But when it came to defending honor and freedom and integrity and sovereignty and independence, he would put blacks to the sword just like he would put the whites and the mulattoes. But ultimately, I think this is the one course of action that I disagree with them heavily. And in fact, like mentioned before, General Moise was among the most popular military men on the island. And I think that it was a miscalculation on their part. You know, rest in peace, Moise. And the story behind the Moise assassination goes something like this. In an effort to keep peaceful relations with France, Toussaint started to punish generals and officers who instigated the masses to launch massacres against the white population. This position of maintaining peace damaged his standing among the black masses. Toussaint's nephew Moise launched a massacre in the northern regions and was put to death when Toussaint discovered his plans to overthrow him and take over the government. Toussaint's nephew was extremely popular for his pro-black stance and his murder damaged Toussaint's credibility among the Africans heavily who felt that Toussaint was siding with the whites. Toussaint was the first African head of state forced to take on the balance of act for working for his people while trying to maintain diplomatic relations with the European powers. Black leaders were always seen as sellouts when trying to please both sides. You gotta pick a side. Dessalines did not care for balancing interests. Dessalines was raised by an African woman on the plantation of one of the most sadistic owners in Haiti. His body permanently scarred from years of abuse due to the innate rebellious spirit that he had. Dessalines hated Europeans. December 1801, the French began to arrive on warships, bringing over 30,000 troops, including General André Rigaud and other members of the defeated Southern Mulatto regime, returning for revenge and sponsored by the white daddies. Napoleon's original plan was for a peaceful overthrow and exile, arresting Toussaint and his generals and deporting them to a French prison. The warships and numerous troops were supposed to serve as intimidation tactics. 
If the African generals refused deportation, Napoleon's second option was to launch war until the death. The next cause of action would be to seize all weapons from the black population. The final course of action would be to deport all white women who slept with black men during Toussaint's administration. Napoleon heard rumors circulating about the wealthy white female landowners who would send letters to Toussaint and throw themselves at the African generals and officers. Toussaint, having been a ladies man who fathered over 10 children, was rumored to have wealthy white French mistresses. And it wasn't just Toussaint, this was common among all of the high-ranking generals Dessaline I mean Dessaline he was such a ladies man Dessaline was rumored to have a girlfriend in every commune in every town in every hood in every block Dessaline had a chick on every town that he went through it was like every time he came to and conquer the city he just had to you know what I mean get a girlfriend there so every time he returned she was there I don't know what it was bro Dessaline had kids all over the island Dessaline had girlfriends all over the island you got to understand um, these brothers were built like athletes you know Christoph was brolic you know what I mean in shape over six feet, Dessaline, you know, brolic in shape, over six feet. You know, Toussaint was like five foot four or five foot, you know, five foot five. You know, he was short and skinny, but you know what I mean? He was in control of these big, you know, gladiators. So at the end of the day, you know, me humble, short, skinny man, but you know what I mean? Got the spirit of a guy who's eight foot tall. All of the rebel generals had highly educated African wives from privileged backgrounds. Henry Christoph's wife, for example, came from an elite business class mixed race family, but he was also known to have many mistresses. Shortly after arriving in the north, the French troops attacked Fort Liberté in the northeast, confirming it was war. Christophe was commander in chief in the north and advised all women and children to head up into the mountains and into the underground network of hideout spots. French General Charles Leclerc demanded that Henri Christophe surrender authority over to him. Refusing to surrender, Henri Christophe burned the entire city to the ground and retreated into the hills to protect the women and children. The French attacked the northwest and then marched south, setting up stronghold in Port-au-Prince. Toussaint's defensive strategy was total destruction if conquering the territory was not possible, saying that the soil bathed with our sweat shouldn't provide resources for any of our enemies. Another defensive strategy was Dessaline fireproofing his properties and encouraging the other soldiers to do the same. Dessaline routinely ambushed French strongholds and massacred every non-African he encountered, encouraging his men to leave bodies stacked in the street as a method of psychological warfare against the enemy. Bodies should lay decomposing for days under the Caribbean heat, similar to how the French would display hunger. African bodies and decapitated African heads during the colonial era. To avoid war, the French government knew Toussaint's kids were sent to France for school and guaranteed their safe return if the African generals surrender. Five months into the invasion, General Charles Leclerc contacted Napoleon for more troops and more resources due to the destruction of the territories they occupied. Similar to the tactics used against Andre Rigaud in the War of Knives, Toussaint's offensive strategy was attack, destroy, and retreat, causing maximum damage while avoiding direct engagement and losing unnecessary lives. By retreating into the mountains, Toussaint would let the time pass as the enemy is starved and losing numbers from sickness and then launch another spontaneous attack, always keeping the enemy paranoid. In February 1802, the French attacked the Northwest base and Toussaint lost between 400 to 800 soldiers and had to retreat. 200 to 300 Frenchmen also died. The Maroons would sometimes raid town spontaneously and massacre members of the white French population. Before the war started, Toussaint would punish them for these actions when he was trying to maintain peace on the colony. Many of the Maroons had fought on the side of the mulattoes against Toussaint during the War of Knives. The Maroons also served as intelligence agents for the French, providing them information on Toussaint and Dessalines' movements. One of Dessalines' ambush attacks on the French was intercepted and he ended up losing hundreds of men and had to retreat back north. Dessaline had been trying to recapture Port-au-Prince from the French for weeks. The French eventually took control of the north and pushed Toussaint into the west. Now the Maroons were men who were enslaved Africans who ran away before the war started and set up their own little communities hidden away in the mountains, hidden away in the woods. Meaning that when they landed off them boats, them boys got the hell out of Dodge, man. Them boys ran up into the mountains in the middle of the night and joined up the free enslaved Africans. You know, because the ones that were already free, that were already in the mountains, they heard about it, they knew about them. And you know, a lot of these people, they come from the same ethnic group. So they have their own little communities, their own little pockets on the island. So they heard about the Maroons living up in the mountains. So the Maroons had their own agenda. The Maroons, they didn't really see things out of our two cent. And even the mulattoes, they had their own thing going on. And usually because these guys didn't have much written down and we didn't really study them too in depth, we never really studied the Maroons. And we have to really dive deep into you know the Maroon generals that did their thing because they played a heavy, heavy role in the war as well. They played a heavy, heavy role. Like I said, General La Plume, the, Mar the Maroon leader who brought over 3,000 troops to Toussaint back in the day. So, you know, the Maroons, we don't really speak about them too much, but they were a heavy component on the island during the colonial period and during the war as well. In March 1802, the legendary battle at Cut-A-Pierre-Wu. 
The French attacked the Haitian fort for several days unsuccessfully. Dessalines never surrendered, and almost 2,000 Frenchmen died during this battle, with the Haitians only losing 200. The large amounts of death and bloodshed at the hands of Dessalines in every single military engagement began to demoralize the French, as they constantly needed more supplies from overseas due to the constant Haitian ambushes that left the territory burned down. Dessalines began mobilizing troops shortly afterwards in March on the north and recapture it. Dessalines ambush French troops causing them to flee. Dessalines chased them down and top ranked French General Charles Dugois was murdered during this engagement with the French army losing an additional 800 men. Another top ranked French general and self proclaimed white supremacist Rochambeau returned to retaliate but ended up losing 300 men and was forced to retreat again. The hit and run drive by ambush tactics of Dessalines destroyed the French during these engagements. Alexander Petro eventually joined the ranks of the Africans after witnessing so many losses taken by the French side. The main reason why whites did not trust the mulattoes because as soon as the tide began to change Change, they automatically switch sides. Toussaint would conduct intelligence operations where Africans from his side would assimilate into the French army by posing as deserters and traitors and then disappearing when they gathered enough information. Many times the agent would end up wounded or killed if the French became suspicious. After big losses in battle, the French would execute hundreds of Africans taken prisoner, including women and children, including the wives and children of African generals. A group of soldiers recruited from Poland to fight for France ended up abandoning the French army around this time and joined Dessalines troops. French General Charles Leclerc, growing suspicious, arrested mulatto General André Rigaud and deported him to a French prison on false charges, and André Rigaud felt stupid for joining the ranks of the French. Luckily for Alexander Petron, he had already switched sides and avoided prison. Pretending to call a truce, Charles Leclerc offered to send freedom and liberty of all Haitian citizens. Toussaint would be allowed to keep his staff and be able to retire anywhere on the island. After the negotiating terms, Toussaint convinced Dessalines to piece it up also. Terms of the deal included Toussaint's troops being integrated into the French army while maintaining their rank. Around this time, Dessalines began to separate himself as an independent entity and no longer looked to Toussaint for leadership. Shortly after peace was negotiated, Charles de Clerc wrote to France requesting more troops and planning Toussaint's arrest. Toussaint agreed to meet with Charles Leclerc for dinner, where he was ambushed by armed guards and escorted off the premises and placed in custody. His properties raided, cash and possessions stolen by the French government, and his wife and children arrested and deported, where they would spend the next several months being tortured and starved in a cold French prison. Toussaint's wife would be starved to the point where she lost over 100 pounds and broke several bones. She didn't break any bones due to the starvation, she broke bones due to the torture. Now this is what you can call the first official coup d'etat of a revolutionary black leader. As we know, there's been over 30, 40 coup d'etats in Africa, many assassinations, some legendary ones include Patrice Lumumba, also Thomas Sakara, but Toussaint's arrest, deportation, and assassination was the first coup d'etat and assassination of a revolutionary black leader, which would set the domino effect in place and the same tactic would be used many, 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 many times over, over revolutionary black men that just wanted to stand on righteousness, principles, and to defend the dignity and sovereignty of their people against all enemy forces. We still deal with the same thing still to this day, because I guarantee if you have a leader that stands up anywhere in Africa, anywhere on the planet, and stands up for his people against the current world order, he's gonna suffer the same fate. With Toussaint out the way, General Charles Leclerc began making plans to disarm the population. Toussaint had taken the thousands of weapons he purchased from America and Britain and given them to the common folk in case he needed them to rise up at any moment. Charles Leclerc was also confident in his ability to destroy the influence of the remaining African generals, writing to Napoleon saying that Dessalines and Christophe hate each other and he'll take advantage of their disunity by having them destroy each other. This is when nature and the elements joined the battle. A yellow fever pandemic tore up Haiti in 1802, killing 25,000 French soldiers and 25 generals. By summer 1802, news of slavery returning caused mass revolts all over the island. Now let's get into this yellow fever and the 25,000 soldiers and the 25,000, uh, not the 25,000, the 25 generals that died from quote unquote yellow fever. One thing they don't talk about is the French soldiers, like any soldiers, when they went to a foreign land, what is the first thing that these, you know, foreign soldiers usually do when they come to occupy territory? They set up a prostitution ring. They set up a brothel. They set up a system to where the men can get themselves service during wartime. So these men, yes, even though they're fighting to defend the colony from being overthrown and taken over, the French soldiers came over and they're still meeting up with women of the night. They're meeting up with sex workers, quote unquote. 
and Dessaline being a ladies man they don't know like I told you Dessaline he had a girl in every town every city every commune every block every corner you know Dessaline had a, had a little girl that he was smashing that was crushing on him you know what I mean you know you got a, a young brother you know in his early 30s mid 30s you know big general well respected all over the island over six feet tall brolic you know what I mean deep voice powerful energy powerful presence so of course Dessaline was heavily connected with the women of the night all, all the way up to the professional dignified educated women and the wealthy white French landowners all the way down to the women working in the brothels. So Dessaline, he sent many, many sex workers to go meet up with French soldiers where they were poisoned, where they got, you know, led astray, meaning that they were set up, meaning that if they would meet on a certain block, you know, the ladies would say, oh, come meet me here. Come meet me over there. And Dessaline would have Haitian soldiers waiting on that block to blow his head away. So a lot of French soldiers disappeared. They don't know what happened to them. It was like they deserted the army because they never were heard from ever again after they got set up or they got poisoned. You know, they met up with the chick, you know, got poisoned or they met up with the chick, got set up, got assassinated. So many French soldiers, it wasn't just yellow fever that, you know, wiped them away. A lot of them got assassinated set up poison and they just disappeared so in order to really tell the world what happened to all the missing soldiers they said most of them died from a yellow fever but why did they not die from yellow fever in those same numbers when they went to africa to go conquer and colonize in 1802 they didn't just come to haiti only they went to all of their colonies to restore slavery to restore the previous order of things it was just in haiti that they lost they went to martinique and they won they went to guadeloupe and they won they went to west africa and they won but they went to haiti and they lost and they say it was yellow fever no it wasn't yellow fever it was because the French soldiers were degenerates who could not control their sexual discipline for two seconds to stop smashing on prostitutes during the war. And a lot of them lost their lives because of their lust, the lust of the flesh. As news began to circulate that the institution of slavery was going to be reinstated, the black generals began to buy time, began to meet up in secret, began to formulate their own armies and waiting for the right time to strike against the French. Rich plantation owners began arriving in the colony to reclaim their properties and return to the old days. Many wanted revenge. The French put slavery back into law in late 1802. Revolts broke out in every town and Charles Leclerc once again requested more troops and more resources from Napoleon. In a letter to Napoleon, Charles Leclerc revealed that military force would be the only way to bring the colony back under control and he's hung over a hundred captured rebels as psychological warfare but striking fear into the Haitians hasn't worked because they seem to be entertained at the prospect of death both the men and the women die willingly and fearlessly with Toussaint gone Charles Leclerc realized that there were over 2,000 local chiefs scattered throughout the island at the head of their own smaller local armies Toussaint was the only big fish but many small fish kept the fire burning in his absence Charles Belair one of Toussaint's top shooters declared war on French forces in 1802 launching a large-scale revolt in the northern regions Charles Belair was also a teenage soldier in the siege of Savannah alongside American troops during the American revolution with King Henri Christophe and General Andre Rigaud. French troops were able to put down this rebellion and kidnapped his wife and they were both put to death. Black women back in that time, I'm telling you, they were riders. All of the revolutionary wives, they had unbreakable loyalty, willing to go to prison, lose limbs and die for their men, die for freedom. After Charles Belair's death, local rulers began ambushing the ports and ambushing French troops in the same hit and run style as Dessaline and Toussaint, burning towns to the ground whenever they were forced to retreat. When they ran low on ammunition, they attacked the northwest region, burned down the newly rebuilt plantations, and raided a fort that contained military grade equipment. They also carried out a massacre in this region. French troops arrived to restore order, but the rebels had already escaped back into the mountains. During this period of war, all Africans of all ages and genders participated. Men, women, children, all fully engaged in battle. General Angoustoff, still aligned with the French since Toussaint's surrender, told a high-ranking French general that he would burn the entire island to the ground if Napoleon was serious about reestablishing slavery. With the revolt raging high among the general population, General Charles Leclerc wrote to Napoleon saying that the only way to save the colony is to launch a war of extermination where every African man, woman, and child above the age of 12 will be eradicated. Obviously, this plan would go on to fail and Dessaline would return to favor with the 1804 massacre of the white French population. Rebel forces grew larger by the day as black soldiers slowly abandoned the French while the yellow fever pandemic, quote unquote, killed hundreds of white French troops every week. Christophe began communicating with rebel leaders throughout the country, preparing his return to the rebellion. One night, he invited Charles Leclerc to dinner, but came protected with his own security detail. 
The meeting ended up in tense arguments between Christophe and Leclerc for his betrayal of Toussaint and called Leclerc a parasite. General Leclerc accused Christophe of treason but could not arrest him because Christophe already had his shooters in attendance. Days later, Leclerc held a meeting with the generals and the top businessmen where both parties disagreed on how to move forward. The rich landowners supported slavery and the black generals opposed it. Tension in the colony continued to grow. Mulatto leader Alexander Pichon abandoned France once again around this time, taking 3,000 troops with him and launching an attack on French forces stationed in the north. Panicked by the ambush, the French rounded up every African in their town, put them on ships, and drowned them in the sea. Men, women, and children. Dessalines heard the news and began traveling to towns he controlled, telling his supporters to be ready for war. A day later, Christophe joined the rebellion. French troops attempted to arrest Dessalines while he was eating breakfast at a meeting, but a mulatto woman warned him, and he narrowly escaped. On November 2nd, 1802, Leclerc died, Rochambeau filling his seat, and requested 35,000 troops from France. French forces re-established strongholds on the northwest and the northeast, and the pandemic began to die down. At first, many local rebel leaders did not trust Dessalines, Christophe, and Alexander Pétion due to them integrating into the French army after Toussaint had negotiated an agreement for peace. Many felt that they were agents working for the French and did not think that they were sincere about joining the rebel cause. Some local leaders brought their militias on board. Other local chiefs who refused to submit to the military hierarchy were set up and assassinated, mainly by Christophe. For some reason, Rochambeau set his target on the mulattoes first, assassinating many rich mulattoes and seizing their property. The revolt was mainly concentrated in the north, but now the south had also risen up in rebellion. Rochambeau had drowned so many Africans during his administration that most of the population didn't even want to eat fish anymore. Rochambeau also imported thousands of dogs to track down Africans. Rochambeau's loyalty to white supremacy created bonds of unity between the Africans and the mulattoes. As a form of entertainment, an African man was lynched in a public theater and eaten by dogs every day. These events would be held by the upper class political and business elite. Rochambeau declared that African women must be eliminated also because black women tended to be more cruel than the men. Some French troops didn't have the heart to drown innocent women and children, so they opted to sell them into slavery on other islands. When this was detected, Rochambeau would fire any troops that disobeyed his orders. Dessalines began to retaliate against the white French population. One day, Rochambeau executed 500 Africans and dumped their bodies in mass graves. Dessalines returned the favor by hanging 500 French civilians with their bodies left in public display. Due to the fearlessness and bravery with which he approached death, racist medical theories were created during this time stating that blacks are less sensitive to pain. In 1803, war between France and Britain broke out once again, with British ships blockading French ports. The British supplied Dessalines with weapons and resources, and Dessalines paid cash to avoid being in debt to them politically. He did the same with the United States. Now, instead of raiding French bases for weapons, Dessalines had a plug on military equipment and was now stepping into the arena of international politics, doing deals with foreign governments. Taking the ambush tactics to the sea, the Africans built small boats and began launching attacks on French vessels, captured two warships, and slaughtered everybody on board. Running low on money, Rochambeau raised taxes and this angered the whites who were already living in constant anxiety due to the rebellion. The situation became so desperate and the Africans were dominating so much that many elite whites began to beg the French government to surrender. They preferred to call a truce with the Africans just to restore order to the colony. The final championship match of the revolution took place on November 1803, the Battle of Vertier. Dessalines marched into battle with over 27,000 troops, over 13 times more soldiers than the French. The entire French army was almost eliminated, with only 800 remaining. Rochambeau held a meeting among his generals and decided that it was best to evacuate the island. Dessalines wrote letters to his generals and local chiefs stating that the country is ours. Dessalines gave Rochambeau a grace period of 7 to 10 days to evacuate or he would begin to launch attacks on French vessels. Dessalines also agreed to safely return the French troops he took hostage during war, but changed his mind and killed them instead, as revenge for all the innocent Africans that the French army drowned in the ocean. The British arrested Rochambeau and many of his generals, sending them to British prison for many years. January 1804, Dessalines declared independence, as we know shortly after, the 1804 massacre of the French population. Now go check a video I dropped a few days ago. I went in depth, 30 minutes analysis on the entire massacre of 1804. I do not want to stretch this video out too long. We already approaching one hour, but go check that out. I dedicated a whole video just to that one event. The British government would remain allies with Haiti for the next 20 years under the administrations of Dessalines and Christophe. In one famous declaration, Dessalines said, Peace to our neighbors, but hatred eternal to France. The only whites spared in the 1804 massacres were the Polish soldiers who joined the rebel army, as well as the American and British diplomats, priests, and doctors. Around this time, 
the beginning of many building projects began to take place between Dessaline and Kristoff, the most famous being the Citadel, but Dessaline constructed over 21 military forts in anticipation of future French invasion. General Alexander Pichon became the most powerful mulatto on the island. Mulatto controlled areas in the south began reestablishing slave labor and doing private business under the nose of the government. This enraged Dessaline. Rebellions in the south would continue for many years after independence under forgotten leaders like Lamu de Lens and Goman, with Africans in the south creating separate governments between 1807 and 1820, secretly funded by Christophe in the north. As we know, in 1806, Dessaline was assassinated. Now, why was he assassinated? There are many um, theories that are floating out in the wind, but the main reason that I would say is this. It was a variety of reasons. Number one, like I said in my video during the 1804 massacre, Dessaline did not have the elder respect that Toussaint had. Remember, like I said, Toussaint was an elder. He was in his 60s. Dessaline was around the same age, the same generation as the majority of officers in the army, the majority of generals as well. So Dessaline did not have that elder respect, that elder superiority over the young boys that Toussaint had. So the orders that he would give out were sometimes disobeyed, just to say the least, right? So his authority was always being tested. And essentially, to grab power, the mulattoes conspired with many of the other ruling class blacks to get Dessaline out the way because Dessaline was getting in the way of their contraband game. Like I said, remember what I said, many of the mulattoes were doing business under the nose of the government, meaning that they were doing import export trade without paying their sufficient taxes to the state. And this is what enraged Dessaline. And let's just say in retaliation, Dessaline publicly humiliated these men who would work under the nose of the government. And this would also cause resentment in their hearts because not only were they feeling resentment to the fact that they had to live under African rulership under a black man. Many of the Southern mulattoes felt that that was beneath them because they were the son of elite rich European planters, but also because Dessaline, he did not believe in quote unquote capitalism. He believed in socialism. Yes, Dessaline was a socialist. I'm not a socialist. I do not agree with that, but Dessaline was a socialist and you are coming from men who are businessmen. The mulatto elite, they were known for giving out loans. They were known for dominating the business arena. They were known as being capitalists. So you have a man who has taken the control of everything and put it under the state. Yes, of course, they were not going to be happy with that. They were not going to be happy with losing their ancestral properties because many of these properties, these plantations were in the family for generations. And Dessaline sees that all by the state. Dessaline put that all under the rulership of the state and he was going to distribute land to everybody, to the African that was enslaved, that is now free, to the wealthy mulatto that owned property. Everyone was going to be seen as equal. Everyone was going to have a piece of the pie because everyone equally put in work and died on the battlefield and sacrificed their lives. As we know, you know, many people did not agree with that. So Dessaline was eliminated. And that's usually what happens um, when you are eliminated because you are going on and taking on certain policies that many powerful people do not agree with. And um, unfortunately, we lost the greatest general of all time in 1806. He never saw the age of 50 and he never got to enact his policy. So we never really got to see what his administration would have looked like. Unlike General Christophe, who we saw was in power for over 10 years. And we saw all the beautiful things that he built, all the schools and the chateaus and the citadel and the palace and, you know, the economic splendor that he brought to the north side of Haiti. You know, we never really got to see Dessaline spread his wings as a political figure. But like I said, in my opinion, Dessaline should have never been the head of state. He should have been the head of the military with Christophe being the head of state. And I think if the country would have got started like that in that administration, that kind of setup, after Toussaint was deported and captured, I think that we would have been way farther down the line. We would have built way more. It would have been way less chaotic. It would have never been divided into two governments for over 10 years like it was. It would have just been better, man. Christophe at the helm, head of state, Dessaline, head of the military and i think it would have been beautiful man i think Toussaint would have been proud and i think it would have worked that way because christophe had the same political genius and the same political mind as Toussaint. remember what i said when christophe met up with charles the clerk you know he came with his shooters ready though you know even christophe was the young boy the youngest out of all of them and when i say the youngest out of all of them i'm talking about the generals that came from slavery Alexander Pichon was the youngest youngest. He was the young boy for real. Like during the revolution, I believe he was in his 30s. But Christophe, he had the same political acumen as Toussaint. And when he went to meet up with Charles Leclerc, he did not make the same mistake as Toussaint. He, he came with the shooters. He came with his shooters, man. And Dessaline, I can say this. Dessaline, 
he marched on the Europeans, destroyed the Europeans, assassinated the Europeans, massacred the Europeans, and the Europeans were never able to take him out. The only people that were able to take Dessaline out were those closest to him, were his generals, were his inner circle, his closest men. The Europeans, that was one figure that they hated. They hated Dessaline because Dessaline was undefeated against them, marched on them, destroyed them, crushed them, and they never got to retaliate against him. They never got to strike back against him. They never got to capture him. They never got to assassinate him. They never got to hang him. They never got to shoot him. They never got a chance to even smack him. They never even got a chance to even spit in his face. They never got him, man. Untouchable, undefeated. Man, that's why they wiped him out the history books. The only people that could kill Dessaline was those closest to Dessaline. Dessaline died from the hands of a black man. He did not die from the hands of a white man. And Dessaline marched on over 100,000 white men. Marshal over a hundred thousand Europeans, assassinated them, crushed them, hung them, dismembered them, drowned them, retaliated against them, avenged them. Man, listen, listen, greatest black man of all time, greatest black man of all time, led the greatest slave revolt in human history. The only successful slave revolt in human history defeated multiple world powers to the point where you had elite landowning Frenchmen begging the French government to surrender just to restore order to the colony because Dessaline was marching on them, marching on them with no mercy. It's crazy, man. Y'all made me go a whole hour. That's crazy, man. I never drop videos a whole hour, man. I be trying to drop videos, keep it to like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, short form videos, quick videos. Y'all made me drop a whole podcast. I get y'all the whole Man, I gave y'all a deep dive into the Haitian Revolution, into Toussaint, into Dessaline. Man, extensive work. This type of information, you would have to go to the elders, the Haitian elders, and get it in Creole. You're not even going to get it written down. This would only be an oral history, something among the family. You would not get this in English broken down from the African perspective, especially. You would only get this from the European perspective in English. But this is the African perspective of the Haitian Revolution. Man, listen, it's your boy Nefakari Dessaline back in the building. Yes, indeed. Greatest black man of all time. Dessaline to Saint Levitio. And I'm gone. Peace.